What's up, y'all? It's me. For today's video, I've got some exciting topics. It's about sobriety. It's about rappers. It's about books. Things I enjoy. Drinking coconut water. I like this brand better than the Vita, I think it's called. Because they don't put the acids in it. If you look at the recipe, it's just coconut water. Maybe a tiny little bit of added sugar. But I'm not going to get mad about that. If you know a better one that I could get, please let me know. Don't just tell me not to drink this one. But uh, you're probably wondering, based on the title, what do I have in common with Gucci Mane and 50 Cent other than maybe a Rolex, which I'm sure they have, right? Well, I also mentioned I'd be showing people some books from my library. These are two books from my library that I like a lot. When I got sober, I started reading books. So I got books from people who I respect. These are two successful men, musicians that I respect a lot, right? Now, you're probably already able to piece it together. In both of these books, something that they say is imperative, paramount, of utmost importance is sobriety. These two men are sober, right? In 50's book, he mentions he might puff it into his mouth and then blow it out for social reasons, but he will not inhale marijuana because his tolerance is so low, he knows he's going to get too high, not be able to operate, right? Gucci's reasoning is a little different. He used to get real high. I'm sure 50 did too. And then he went to prison. He cleaned himself up because he had to. And once he got clean, he's never gone back. And he says, you know, you'll get so clean, you'll get so different. People will start saying you're a clone of your old self. You're a completely different person, a different genetic makeup. Which is a huge compliment, I think, for a man to get. When he rebirths himself into a more evolved being. You know, you think about somebody like Kid Boo versus Majin Boo. Evolution. You know what I mean? Evolution. So that covers that. I recommend those two books. They're both very good. You won't go wrong reading them. I haven't gotten Gucci's biography yet. That's next on my list to add to my library. I try to add a book or two to my library every week. So that way it slowly grows like a garden. I don't read a book a week, I'll be honest with you, but I try to keep up with them and not just let them pile up and not read them also. So I think that's important. But today's day 31, my personal sobriety journey. I feel lucky. I feel blessed. Today's a Monday, which you may or may not know is for the moon, moon day. So the ring I have on is silver with a pearl. For the daily ring. I mentioned I have a ring for each day of the week. To kind of honor the planet. Or the spherical body. That rules over this day. A lot of people might not know. What meanings different words have. Monday isn't just a word. It's a day. Dedicated to the moon. That's all I have for today. I guess I'll give you a little update on the mood. I don't feel as tired, I don't feel as depressed as I might have a few days ago. Day 31, I'm not quite to week 5 yet. I do feel like I kind of came over the hump, over the peak of the uh, rebound, maybe from specifically marijuana. I think I worked through steroids pretty pretty fast within a couple of weeks, a few weeks. But um, my consumption of, of weed was a lot higher over a much longer period of time. So I think it's more natural that... That'll take a little longer. I've been smoking weed probably for 15 years, almost every day. I was, and then I was on steroids for about six years. So you can tell it's, you know, and it escalated over time. So the first couple of years I was on steroids, it wasn't as bad as the last couple of years, right? Weed kind of did the same thing over time. They didn't even have dabs and the concentrates out and the strong edibles made out of concentrates and RSOs back when I started 
that I knew about or was accessible to me. By the end of my consumption, I was smoking a quarter of medical weed a day, testing over 30% THC. I was eating grams in THC in terms of the edibles. I wasn't really dabbing as much, but there was RSO that would pass through and different things like that, and it just got really out of hand. My consumption was very high. And I think that's also part of why it hit me so hard when I ran out and spent a, a day or two in that hospital. So, you know, if you can slow it down, even if you're not going to come off completely, because the higher it gets and the more you're consuming, the more you're setting yourself up for a bad time. If you run out of rebound, man, um, I've seen certain people that I know kind of hit that limit. I truly believe that the human body and brain especially has a limit to how much of something like that you can consume in your lifetime. So I'm curious the magic of how somebody like, you know, Snoop Dogg smokes as much as he does or what they do. Maybe there's a Joe Rogan type angle where you take a month off a year to kind of keep it rolling. I know some people that like to consume certain substances will take a month off a year so that their tolerance kind of resets and doesn't creep up year over year over year. Like mine was with, uh, you know, marijuana and steroids. But, uh, the best advice as given in both of these books is to be clean, is to be off of everything. Not only will it cost you less money, you'll have more of a clean energy source. You'll have clear thoughts. So the biggest thing I notice about sober me versus high me is I make better decisions. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that I was high off of weed when I decided to hop on steroids, right? I was high off of weed when I decided to keep up in the dose of steroids. So if you can handle things in moderation and perform well, God bless you. But I was one of those people where no amount was enough, right? There's a video on my page where I talk about the day I snorted 16 Perk 30s in one day, right? Crazy, stupid, you know, very dumb, not impressive, not cool, dumb thing to do. But um, that is what my consumption was like. And um, what I was doing at the time, so when I hear about somebody like, rest in peace, Juice World, who I think he ate about 18 of them, I was closer to death a couple times than I really wanted to believe or actually be. And that wasn't clear to me until I was sitting in the hospital wondering if I would ever leave it, right? So that's where I'm at. You can tell I have a little more energy. Um, I have to watch anxiety now that I'm off the beta blocker. I have to watch temper. I notice I have a bit of a temper about me if I want to. Um, and that's on me, you know. Can't blame other people. Expect other people to kind of tiptoe around that or go around it. Um, especially out in public and around People who really don't know you or care, honestly. You know, that's on you. You're the only one that can keep yourself out of a hospital, out of a prison, out of a jail cell. You know what I mean? Honestly, honestly. I'm sure there's things we would all like to do that are very illegal by the laws of man right now. And if not, then that tells you about what I have to battle. You know, anytime I want to hurt myself or somebody else, I have to figure out how to not. Because not only will that open up karmic repercussions get in trouble man and i might have spent my whole school career my military school career i might have spent a good chunk of my life being comfortable being in trouble but i can tell you that it's more fun to not be in trouble and to know that what you're doing can't get you in trouble like the example i'll use is i used to buy street weed illegally at one point and when i switched over to a medical card that's how it got me real hard because i realized man that was the only law i was breaking so I had this whole persona where I felt like a criminal, right? I felt like maybe even some type of wannabe gangster or something, man. Just because I was smoking a bunch of illegal weed, interacting with drug dealers, going to trap houses, things like that. You know what I mean? And as soon as I was able to get legal weed, all of a sudden, that completely changed. And I didn't have to break a single law. And I started to question that sense of identity I have, which is, am I really a criminal? I've never spent a day in jail. You know, God bless I've never really crossed a lot of crime lines. You know what I mean? Like, why do I feel like when I watch a gangster movie, I'm, I'm not one of them. You know, I'm a civilian. I'm, I'm a kid who got into some trouble, who grew up into an adult who really doesn't, to be honest. And I think that moment of clarity was very useful to me 
because then I was able to see in the mirror what I am and what I'm not. You know, if I talk to somebody who's who's lived a life of crime or done some serious time, I speak as an outsider, not an insider. I know for a fact I haven't walked that mile. I don't understand that. You know what I mean? And at this point, maybe I'm lucky and privileged enough that I don't I don't want to because I'm not going to judge people who they enter crime to feed themselves. They feed their family, you know, try to make a better life for themselves. I do believe that there's a setup the same way that something like World War II, a group of people who was determined to be undesirable were placed in what was called ghettos. You can see the same thing happening on a mass scale somewhere like America and everywhere, man. So I'm not going to judge people who do what they have to do to eat, you know, that are hungry. But why would I choose to leave a place where I don't have to do that and, and then decide that I'm going to do that? It's almost disrespectful to people who don't want to do it and have to and would like to get out of it. You know what I mean? A lot of people who think it's cool, excuse me, think it's funny, think it'll make them better. That's a lie. And I'm sympathetic because I know that there's a lot of programming coming from media and different places to nudge people in that direction. Oh, your nine to five job is square. Your legal money that you make is corny. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people will believe that things and they'll give up something that they have to go get something that they really don't want or need. And that trade off is a, it's disrespectful to the amount of people who don't have that option. They're trying to work their way towards something better, right? I understand somebody who's facing a slew of minimum wage jobs and they would like to make a little more money. But the biggest thing I would like to put out is your freedom, your peace of mind, your comfort, your sense of self, your identity is worth more than the money you think you'll get trading those things, right? And there's a lot of people who think they don't have that. But if you look deep, you look within yourself, you do have dignity, you do have something to be proud of. You might even have an opportunity that that might not be as shiny or as glittery, and it could potentially be a way out that doesn't send you somewhere like prison, man. Just something to think about. So I feel like to deploy gratitude and respect, I have to use the opportunities that I've been given. And then with the perspective and resources that that gives me show the pathway show a better way you know what i mean i'll quote a rapper little baby in a song he says i don't know it exactly um i don't have the words off the top of my head but he says something like there's a better way to live out here and i'm going to keep it in their ear where people might not be showing you or pushing at you this certain path but there is a, a better way than to throw your life away, your future away. And if you go on YouTube, this, this platform, and you watch enough prison stories and hear it from the real people who have been through the actual places, they'll be the first people to tell you why you don't want to go there. You know what I mean? So don't let a movie or somebody who's never been and is never going convince you to go. Because I'll tell you right now, those systems are for profit. Unfortunately, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with for profit hospitals. I don't agree with for profit prisons. I don't agree with for profit rehabs. Because I think they look at a metric, which I learned in business school, called customer lifetime value. You have more money to make off of somebody if they leave and come back, leave and come back, leave and come back, or just never leave then you actually make if you rehabilitate that person and send them back into society, right? Only somewhere like Germany, maybe, and other places that truly rehabilitate prisoners and don't create penal colonies in disguise, right? Slave labor in disguise. Those places understand that they might lose some money in the prison system, but they'll gain it back when that person is working and following the law and not harming their neighbor, right? And there's a sense of community and there's a sense of comfort and everybody's able to make some money. Everybody's able to feed themselves so they don't resort to certain things. 
Because I think that's one of the biggest lies and illusions that people will push. If you give people a good option, they won't take the bad option. Nine out of ten times. Unless all of a sudden they have to to impress their family or friends or somebody who has already been programmed with that lie. So, something to think about. If I'm wrong, you can tell me. But based on what I've seen and heard, I think that might be true. Stay safe. Stay dangerous. Do your best to stay free in body, mind, and spirit. Prometheus out.